Hello and welcome. I call the channel The Jungle Nook. And in this video, I'd just like to take this opportunity to talk with you a little bit about fertilizing potted plants. Regardless if the plant's indoors or outdoors, the information in this video is specifically for those plants that we are growing in containers, be it a, a pot or a hanging basket. The way that we fertilize our plants and the reason why we fertilize them how we do is totally different from how you would fertilize plants that are growing right in the ground, regardless if they're the same type of plant or not. You do not want to take the information that I'm going to give you in this video and use that for fertilizing or how you're going to fertilize your outdoor plants. The reasons why and how you do one or the other, they're completely different. My advice is if you're ever looking up information about fertilizing, make sure that the information that they're giving you, make sure it's what they're talking about regarding if it's for a plant you're growing in the ground or in a pot. It really does matter. When we're fertilizing, what we're doing is we are adding nutrients to the soil for the plant. And the reason that we have to fertilize our, our plants that are growing in pots is because we water them so much. And we're actually flushing out the nutrients right out of the soil. It's not necessarily that the plant is using them and depleting the, the nutrients in the soil. We're actually flushing the, the nutrients right out of the soil and we have to replenish it. And I'm going to talk about the, uh, the main nutrients that we have to be supplying our potted plants with. I will list them and give a very brief description of the primary use of each individual nutrient. And what I mean by that is Regardless what the function is of the plant, maybe uh, photosynthesis, root development, hormone regulation, the immune system, regardless what function uh, we're talking about, each one requires a whole variety of different nutrients, just in different amounts. And in my description of these individual nutrients, I'm just going to be explaining what the primary use of that nutrient is. The nutrients are actually used for a whole host of different functions within the plant. Nearly all plants, there are a few exceptions, but nearly all plants require the exact same nutrients and use them in the exact same way. There are a few um, exceptions, uh, carnivorous plants for one, you know, plants that consume insects, they're different. But, you know, orchids, cacti, succulents, tropical plants, they all use the same nutrients and use them in the same way. And when you go to the store to purchase a fertilizer, when you see a all-purpose fertilizer, Nearly always, that means you're going to have all of these nutrients that I'm going to be talking about in that fertilizer because it's an all-purpose fertilizer. But not to be confused with a balanced fertilizer. We do not want to use a balanced fertilizer in our potted plants. When they say it's a balanced fertilizer, they're talking about the primary nutrients. That's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the three numbers that they usually display front and center on the package. And if it's a balanced fertilizer, that might be something like a 10-10-10. And what balanced means is that those primary nutrients are in equal parts. And we do not want to give our plants 
these primary nutrients in equal parts. The reason for that is plants require three times as much nitrogen as they have phosphorus. And the potassium, that last number, needs to be at a minimum somewhere in between those first two numbers. Basically what you want to do is you want to look at that middle number, multiply that by three, and that's what you want the first number to be. And that last number, you want that to be at a minimum in between those first two numbers. It can be higher, but at a minimum, you want it to be in between. Because that is the ratio at which the plant needs those nutrients to be. Now, <clears throat> the nitrogen, that first number. Nitrogen, you know, we're told that's for, for a nice healthy foliage, and that's true. But actually, the leaf requires nitrogen in it because nitrogen is what is required to produce chlorophyll. That's what the nitrogen is doing for our houseplants. Primarily, it is being used to produce chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is what is inside the leaf that is absorbing the light and using that light and creating energy to engage in photosynthesis. And the second number, the phosphorus, that is primarily used for photosynthesis. If you have that second number the same as the first number, if you have just as much phosphorus as nitrogen, you're going to have a nitrogen deficiency. And the plant is not going to be able to engage efficiently in photosynthesis. That third number, potassium, is primarily used for the immune system, which helps protect your plant from things like disease. Also, it is primarily used for uh, regulating and moving water and nutrients throughout the plant, which is how the plant protects itself from cold weather or hot weather. And it is uh, how the plant, it uses that in a way that helps the plant to protect its root system from drought when the, when the roots happen to be in overly dry soil. So nitrogen, that's basically the building blocks of the plant, and it works in conjunction with the phosphorus. And the potassium, that's the protector of the plant. That's the immune system and its abil ability to protect itself from cold, heat, and um, from drought. Those are the, pri the three primary nutrients of a plant. Just remember to have a ratio of three one, two. Multiply that second number, the phosphorus, by three to know how much nitrogen the plant's going to be requiring. And then somewhere in between those two numbers, you want a minimum of somewhere in between those two numbers of potassium. That number can be higher. You just don't want it to be below the average of the first two. So those are the primary nutrients, the one the plant consumes the most of. There are some secondary nutrients, which the plant, you know, it needs. All these nutrients are vital. But the secondary nutrients, these ones here, they use less of them. Uh, one of them is calcium. And calcium is vital for new young growth. If you have ever had leaves that were starting to form and for some reason, and you don't know why, they just kind of fell off or they never fully opened or developed, that's a pretty sure sign 
of a calcium deficiency. And the thing about calcium, it's the one nutrient that the plant has to have readily available as that new growth is forming because although the plant does have the ability to move nutrients around within the plant as needed, once calcium has been deposited in a certain part of the plant, in the roots, the foliage that's already developed, the stem, wherever, it is not able to be moved from one area to the next. As the plant is growing, it needs a supply of calcium to take straight to that new growth. So calcium is for new and young growth. Then you have magnesium. Now, magnesium is used to uh, help facilitate in the uptake of nutrients and, and in moving the nutrients and water around within the plant. It's also vital for uh, the formation and production of sugars and proteins, oils and fats during photosynthesis. And it's a component of the chlorophyll as well, which is all part of photosynthesis. And magnesium, what it does is it actually, it helps to carry the phosphorus, that second number that's real important for photosynthesis, to the leaves where it's needed during photosynthesis. And the third and last secondary nutrient that I'm going to mention that we have to be real aware of is sulfur. Sulfur is needed also in the production of chlorophyll. Now, the next list that I'm going to go through is trace elements. The plant needs really tiny amounts of these nutrients, but again, they are very vital. And they are copper, iron, magnesium, and zinc, all of which are vital for the plant to be able to produce chlorophyll, which again is necessary for photosynthesis. And the last two is chlorine, which is also vital for photosynthesis, and boron. Boron is needed for the development of new cells and also to keep existing cells healthy. When I went over this list, you might have heard a few things that you might have been surprised. For instance, sulfur, copper, um, and chlorine. Because those can be toxic for a plant, but they're only toxic at really high levels. They are actually required and are essential in very low amounts. And again, the description that I gave for these, these nutrients, I'm just talking about their primary use, what the bulk of these nutrients go to. All of these nutrients are used in conjunction with one another for all the different functions of the plant. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the difference between organic fertilizers and synthetic fertilizers. Basically, an organic fertilizer is just potting mix that is comprised of a lot of organic material, which is uh, dead and decaying uh, organic material. It can be pine needles, leaves, bark, anything organic that has died and is decomposing within the soil. Those organic uh, materials that are in the soil for an organic fertilizer, that's actually not the fertilizer. That's not the nutrients. You got to have beneficial organisms within the soil, uh, fungus, bacteria, and even really tiny insects that you can't even see that are in the soil 
and they are consuming that dead organic material. They're eating that, and their waste is then consumed by even smaller beneficial organisms in the soil. They eat that waste, and then their waste is smaller yet, and that just keeps happening until these organic materials are broken down to a microscopic size or to the molecular level where they're small enough that when we water the plant, these uh, nutrients are absorbed into the water. And then when the roots suck up the water, they're getting water that is nutrient rich. When using an organic uh, fertilizer or an organic soil, you really want that organic material to be comprised of various sizes of organic material. You want there to be, you know, some big chunky pieces like orchid bark. I use orchid bark. It's big, it's chunky, and that will take a long time to break down. It's feeding the, uh, that beneficial life in the soil for a long time. If you're using a well-aged manure <clears throat> or a, a well-aged compost where it's already broken down to a level where it looks just like regular soil, you don't see no chunky material in there, that's not going to last as long in a pot compared to a soil with the larger, more chunky stuff. And what will happen is, is <clears throat> as those organisms feed on that and break it down, it can begin to compact and get dense. And then if that compacted, dense material overly dries out, even after you rehydrate it, it can be kind of hard, it would still be dense, and the roots can have a hard time growing through it, and it can retain too much water. It, it won't drain as quickly or as well as you would want it to. So I would always recommend making sure you have some nice chunky material in there, as well as to add some perlite. To make sure that over time it is still well draining and that 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 perlite will provide uh, little air pockets which is great for aeration because you need oxygen in your soil to keep your roots healthy now synthetic fertilizers all that is is that is the exact same compounds that you're going to get the exact same nutrients that you're going to get when organic material breaks down. When the organic material breaks down to a molecular level, to a microscopic size, it is exactly the same as what we are giving it with synthetic fertilizers. It's just that the synthetic fertilizer has already been broken down to that size so that when you add the nutrients, it is immediately available for the plant. That's why if you have a deficiency with a certain nutrient in your pot, you really want to use a synthetic fertilizer of that nutrient so that it is immediately available for the plant. Perhaps you're, you're using... A, just organic uh, soil, organic fertilizers, but you have, and then have a deficiency. Well, you need to add fresh organics to that soil so that it can start getting broken down to release those nutrients. But that's going to take some time, and it's not going to immediately solve the deficiency problem. You would want to add fresh organics but also use a synthetic fertilizer so that you're immediately dealing with that issue and giving time for those new organics to be able to be broken down, for them to decompose so that those microorganisms can do their job. 
Because again, when those microorganisms uh, are eating, it has to go through a whole process. One life form is consuming it, and then its waste is consumed by a smaller life form, which has even smaller waste, and so on, until it's small enough to get absorbed into the water and thus into the plant. Now, the thing about synthetic fertilizers is they got a lot of salt. And that's because they're taking a concentrated amount of nutrient and letting the salt absorb that. And then when we bring it home, either we're using it where we add water to it, you know, it's a liquid fertilizer, and then that water goes in, dissolves the salt, releases the nutrient, or maybe it's slow-release granular fertilizer that you only need to add about once every six months, and every time you water it, a little bit of that salt dissolves, releasing a little bit of that nutrient. Now, salt is toxic to plants, but not all salts are the same. The salt that they're using in, uh, in the synthetic fertilizer is actually salt that the plants require. But the problem is they don't require that much salt. That's why it's real important to flush the soil. All that is, is when you water, you want to see some of that water going through the soil and out the pot to flush out that soil of the salt. Flush the salt out of the soil, but you're also flushing out the nutrients. And that's why we have to be constantly adding fresh organics and or using synthetic fertilizers. Within the pot, in that soil, there is actually a complete ecosystem. That's the microflora and fauna. That's the, the fungus and bacteria and you know all the other uh, microscopic beneficial life forms. We need to keep them alive. And they need moisture as well as a food source in order for them to be able to live. So when you water, it is important that you do not let your soil overly dry out in between waterings because you will kill that beneficial life and it will take time when you rehydrate it for that colony or for that, those numbers to become sufficient enough to break down enough of that organic material quick enough to be providing nutrients. When you hear, let your soil dry out in between waterings, they don't mean bone dry. Think of a sponge, submerge a sponge in the water. When you take it out and you're wringing it out and all that water is coming out and you just keep wringing it and wringing it out, and no more water comes out, that soil is, or I'm sorry, the sponge, the sponge is still moist. But that's when it's time to rehydrate the soil. Because although the soil is still moist, there's not a high enough moisture content for the plant to be able to absorb it out of the soil. But the soil was still moist enough to keep that uh, uh, beneficial life in there, the beneficial organisms alive, and it was moist enough to protect the roots so that they don't dry out. That's why uh, drainage is so important. You really want to use nice, chunky, organic material and or perlite. Not even and or. You want to use both. Because as that, that uh, chunky material eventually does break down, the perlite never breaks down. It stays there. And it provides aeration and drainage. You don't really need to worry about overwatering a plant in a pot if there is proper drainage of the soil and that the pot is able to physically drain excess water out of it. 
If your soil is well draining and the pot also drains, you're really not going to be able to very easily overwater your plant. I do have a video on root rot. You can check that out. It's got a lot of uh, information about drainage and aeration uh, and watering and stuff. So you don't have to worry about uh, overwatering and getting rut rot. So to have a healthy ecosystem and have all that beneficial uh, microorganisms in the soil, you just got to make sure there's a steady supply of organic material and moisture. Now, the synthetic fertilizers, those uh, microorganisms in the soil, they will also consume that and, and break that down further too. But my recommendation is to use a combination of organic material and synthetic fertilizers. What I do is twice a year, once in the spring and again in the fall, I will put in a all-purpose, slow-release granular fertilizer. So uh, that way I know every time I'm watering, a little bit of that is, is dissolving and constantly feeding the plant. But I also use a liquid fertilizer uh, a couple times a month in the spring and summer and right into the fall when the plant's, you know, in its most vigorous growth mode. I just make sure it has a little extra. And the fertilizers that I use, they are, you know, for those primary nutrients, what I'm using, uh, the nitrogen is 15, the phosphorus is 5, and the, um, the potassium is actually 12, which is higher than it needs to be, but I know I have more than enough and I know that I water my plants enough and flush my soil enough that um, I don't have any nutrients that are going to get so high that they become toxic and you get root burn. When I make up my pots, I put a lot of uh, perlite in with the soil. And my soil is comprised mainly of cocoa core or peat moss because cocoa core and peat moss can hold a lot of moisture, but if it overly dries out, you can just re-moisten it and it's still a nice, soft, fluffy material and I'm not worried about it compacting. The perlite that I put in there is to ensure that any excess water can drain out of the soil and then out of the pot. But I also put nice chunky organic material into my pots as well. That way, I know I got the organic material that's helping with the aeration and the drainage, but also feeding those microorganisms. I also have the slow release fertilizer, so I know that is also feeding those microorganisms and is already readily available for the plant. You really need to make sure your soil is not overly drying out, that it's well draining, and you do want some organic material in that soil. Something else that I do is I use a, uh, another fertilizer. It is extremely weak, but it already has the microorganisms in it. And the reason that I use that is not just because I want to make sure those organisms are in the soil, but if you ever do use a uh, insecticide that you put into the soil, that insecticide will uh, cause that ecosystem within the pot to crash. It will kill those beneficial life forms. So if you have to use a insecticide that you put right into the soil 
you want to make sure that you're starting to flush that soil out a little more regularly and then start adding that beneficial bacteria into the soil. It will just, it will come back all on its own over time, but it can take a while. So I, I will add that, uh, it, it's like a fertilizer. I mean, it is a fertilizer. It's got, it's got nutrients in it because those microorganisms that are in that liquid solution, they need that to live. But I'm actually adding that so that uh, I am replenishing that colony of microorganisms quicker. I only use insecticides that go into the soil into either new plants that I am bringing into the house that I've purchased or for those plants that spent their summer out on the porch. Plants that stay in the house, I don't really use any insecticides on them. I use very few insecticides because insecticides are very toxic to your plants. You don't want to just use insecticides um, and some kind of a, a schedule or regimen to take care of problems with insects. First and foremost, you want a healthy plant so that its own immune system and its own defenses can help protect the plant. And then if you do see a problem with insects, don't panic. The first thing I would recommend would be just using a damp cloth to wipe the leaves and the stems down to try to remove them. Uh, a lot of times that's really all you need, or you can use uh, a natural organic insecticide like neem oil, you know, to wipe off the leaves too. Uh, you want to try to stay away from those real harsh insecticides unless you're really combating some kind of major outbreak that has occurred. Because they are harmful to the plants, and specifically the ones that you put into the soil will, will cause that colony of microorganisms to crash. So, that's the conclusion of the video. I hope you found it uh, helpful. And I would highly recommend watching some of the videos in my playlist tropical houseplants tips and tricks. I got a lot of really good information in there on the care of houseplants and potted plants. Really, I'm not just trying to promote these videos to get more views. They're really beneficial for you guys to watch. The information, it, it is good information. And I, I took the time to make the video for you. So I, I don't really include a lot of this in the newer videos because I already have them made and they're there. I really highly recommend you guys watching some of those videos. So thank you.